in this video, I will um, do another useful calculation based on that set data. Namely, I will do one, one calculation of surface temperature. Um, I'm going to use one of the more crude ones, but it's still precise within a degree or so. So it's, it's still usable for what we want to do, namely look at um, urban heat island phenomena. So, but be aware that there are other ways of doing it um, that can be more precise than the what one I'm using here today. So, um, first of all, we'll um, have to understand something about our data from um, from the Landsat satellite. So, um, the data we've been using when we downloaded is basically what we call digital numbers. So they are strange. Uh, there's some scalar uh, values between zero and sixty-five thousand something or other. Um, so they are they don't really represent anything. There are no units in it as such. They are just they are handled as these integral values because integral values are nice for compressing and that's easy for sending and packing these large data files. Um, if you want to do real calculations on them, you will need to do a calculation from these arbitrary values to the real measurement units of the satellite. Um, this is called the radiance. So this is how much energy the satellite received and it's the units are watts per square meter of the sensor, per steradium, per wavelength, for width for the wavelength. But it doesn't really matter that much. Um, the idea is that these radiants, they are the amount of energy that was received. You can also calculate the reflection, so that is how large of a part of the incoming light that hit the surface that was reflected, that is called the reflection. But here we are looking at the radiance, so the amount of energy received on the sensor. So, um, and what's really important, you can see, so we need to convert our digital numbers to our real measurement data. And there is in this MLT file, remember, I talked about that um, our sensor data when we downloaded them in the folder of all our let's see have I got a uh, yeah so there was this MLT sorry this monitor this monitor so in the folder was this MLT folder file here that I've just opened this is the metadata file of our satellite data has lots of different information about so it's um, USGS, it's um, the date uh, that the file was created. Uh, it has also the date of uh, down here, the date acquired, so the date the satellite. So this was the 25th of August. Um, coordinates, the time of the satellite uh, is always the same time, more or less. Um, and the satellite is always morning ish. Uh, late morning. Um, it's a thing about have, not having the sun at 90 degrees, but trying to have a reasonable angle to the sun, not too dark, not too, so on. So there's lots of considerations about when this data is, but it, this is the time that the data is collected in UTC. And that's all our information. What so? Band one, what is the file name of band two? So, off. so these are the band names out there. Um, cloud cover are the band saturated, so the, the sensor meters maximum. Um, great correction information. Um, what are the max values? Uh, and lots of odds and ends. Um, distance to the sun. Maybe you should see this also. So up here in the beginning, it also has 
uh, Sun, yeah. So uh, the Sun azimuth. So the Sun was almost in 106 degrees. So far south, uh, and it was 43 degrees over the horizon, and it was a bit further away on the Earth than average. This is an astronomic unit, which is the average distance from Earth to the Sun. So it's a bit more than one average distance from the surface of the Sun. Okay, so this is all different information about it, blah, 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 blah. What we're really interested in is down here, it has this that are called radiance. And there's an add band and a multiband. So these are the two variables we need here. So we need to take our digital values and multiply it by our radiance multiplier. So for band 10, the multiplier value, this value is in here. And we need to add the band 10 addition constant. So these two units here, that's what we need to convert from these integer values, the digital value, to a real unit, which is in watts per square meter per to radium per wavelength. So whatever. Um, so let's do this in uh, QGIS. So um, we have our QGIS and um, we didn't add band 10. The band 10 is uh, one of the thermal infrared. So it's, a, so, um, it's, not, it's not a band that ref measures how much energy is reflected. It's how much energy that is emitted as temperature from the surface of the Earth. And we didn't include it in our virtual uh, raster from before. So I'll just uh, pick up band 10 from the file. So that's this one. So this is band 10. And I'll just rename it because this is a really long name. I don't want to have that in my calculations. So I'll just call it B10. So. Good. Uh, now I can find my calculator. So, um, as usually, I go to my processing tools from up here, my toolbox, and start typing. And it's called Raster Calculator. So, in the Raster Calculator, we need to enter our formula where we have our Raster ad Addition. Well, well, multiplier and a radiance addition. Okay, so a radiance addition and a radiance multiplier. So if we look in our file here, we have our radiance multiplier for band 10. This one. So we just copy that and paste it. And we will multiply this by band 10. Um, of course, you could convert this scientific notation to normal commas by setting moving the comma four places, but we'll leave it like this. Should work. Uh, and then we need to add our addition band 10, radiance addition band 10, this one. Like this. And we will set a reference layer so we don't have to set extent and cell size and so on. So we set this itself as a reference layer, B10, and we can run our calculations. So this uh, shouldn't have changed that much. Uh, just have some new units up here. Uh, so I'll just rename this to Radiance Band 10, like that, oh, and 10, so it has a reasonable name. Good. The next thing is that we have to now convert from these radiance values, from now these watts per square meter plus to radium, uh, wavelength and we'll need this to convert this to what we call top of atmosphere brightness. So this is a 
rough temperature because it does not take into account um, the atmosphere between the surface of the Earth and the satellite. So there are methods that are more precise, but for this purpose, this is uh, more than reasonable. It'll be correct within a degree or so. So, um, so we'll use this formula because it's much easier than than trying to use more of the more advanced formulas. Um, so we'll uh, need from our file we have a K two and a K one. So we look in our metadata file. You'll find that we have these constants in the group here of uh, thermal. There's a K two and a K one. So what we wanted to say is that we wanted to say K two and the formula says K two divided by the logarithm. So find our raster calculator and say K two divided by our ln. And make sure we are inside the brackets of K1. So we'll find our K1 here. Divided by the radiance. Plus 1. So this should be what it says here. So K2 divided by the logarithm of K1 divided by our radiance plus 1. So this is our temperature. Um, this will be in Kelvin. And um, just to make it more understandable, I'll convert this to Celsius. By subtracting. 273.15 like that so now I should have my surface temperature in degrees Celsius I'll just do it set my reference layer so I don't have to say it from these parameters and I can run this calculation so and uh, let's see what we got. So we have temperatures between minus 100 and, and 35 degrees. So this is apparently this is some top cloud um, that's in our data set. So we don't really care about that. It was a warm sunny day, so all of the temperatures that are not clouds will be between, I don't know, 17 degrees and, and 35 degrees. So we'll just trick this to be a bit more interesting to look at. So instead of having a single color, we will make a solar color. And I guess from red to blue is fine if we invert them. And then we don't want those negative values. So let's say from 17 degrees, I think water was around 17 degrees that day. So um, something like this. And we can say, OK. And now um, we have this uh, heat map. So you can clearly see that um, this day here on Vestable have these high temperatures. I can uh, this one. And uh, so we had a temperature of 31 degrees there. If you uh, went out into Fehlerparken, so this larger green area up here, you could go down to 24 degrees. Maybe if you find some of the forested air, 23 degrees. So about 8 degrees cooler than it was on Vestaport that day. And if you went into it out to the beach um, and had a little dip, we can find something like 19 degrees. So that's the water temperature. So we can clearly see that we have this uh, phenomenon of urban so all of these urban areas, so Copenhagen, Hortostrup, and so on, all picking up as red, while the agricultural areas around Oskila and so on have a much lower temperature. So a relatively simple calculation 
or at least it's just two formulas you need to type in that can um, help you to um, to get some uh, idea of, um, of of this urban heat phenomena. So there's many different applications um, we can use Landsat data for. I've now shown you calculation of NDVI, so the identification of vegetations, and also the calculation of surface temperature that we can use to um, investigate urban heat islands and the phenomena related to this. Hope it was useful. See you.